and calm zen breath. I've had a little bit too much caffeine today. <laughs> hey there, welcome back to my channel. How's it going? I hope you're doing really well. I hope things are good. I hope you're currently extremely comfy and cozy. I hope life is treating you well. In the time since I last sat down to film a book video, planet Earth has entered an entire new year of existence. That's when you know it's been a while. And we're here to do it all over again, apart from the fact that we now have a snazzy new title. Welcome to To Be or Not TBR. It's tenuous to say the least. I think Shakespeare is probably rolling in his grave. It is in fact a snappy pun referring to the fact that I'm gonna share five books I've read recently, let you know what I thought about them, let you know how I got on with them, and whether I think you should add them to your TBR file. That stands for to be read, by the way. If you're not fluent in TikTok lingo, TBR is to be read, as in your TBR pile, which is that like, looming, ever-growing stack of books on your bookshelf or in the corner of your room that just kind of sits there neglected and haunts you like a Victorian ghost child and you just do your best to ignore it and continue to go out and keep buying new books. So for today's pile I'd say we've got two gems, two goodies and one meh. One that's a bit of a meh. But absolutely no stinkers today. So I think we'll call that a success. A stinker-free stack, I'll call that a success. Oh, and don't forget as well that you can find me over on Goodreads and on Storygraph as well, depending on which one you prefer. I will make sure to link both in the description box. Before I begin, I'm going to have to let the cat outside because she has the perfect timing. Okay, number one, this is If I Had Your Face by Frances Chart. There is a bookmark in here because Adam is currently reading this. We're kicking off on a very high note today, which is always a nice feeling. Let's, uh, let's start high. In fact, in terms of high notes, I feel like this is like Mariah, Ariana level of like whistle tone high note. I'm not gonna lie, did I buy this because the cover intrigued me? Perhaps. So if I had your face, I would say is generally quite a character based story rather than a particularly quick moving plot. It's very much about the characters themselves, their own narratives and the issues that each of them picks up on. It's set in the city of Seoul in South Korea and it gives a glimpse into four different narratives of four main characters that all intertwine together. And each one of them is a young woman. It's all kind of female perspectives and each of them are trying to carve out their own adult life as they've just hit adulthood in a very competitive, consumerist kind of environment in the city. And it's kind of most focused on the intense pressures that women are put under to conform to extremely specific and very, very high beauty standards. And the way that that kind of leads to women being treated as like a commodity and kind of used and being thrown away. It's a bit of an exploration of all of that. And I was so fascinated by it. It wasn't something that I really knew anything about. So for example, one of the characters in this book decides that her life will be vastly, vastly improved if she goes for the plastic surgery decision. She's gonna become the happiest and the most successful that she can possibly be if she undergoes extreme plastic surgery on her face. And I mean that her whole kind of like jaw is reset completely. It changes the whole kind of shape and structure of her face. She'll become basically unrecognizable. But after the very long and very, very painful, quite traumatic process, she will then kind of tick all the boxes, meet all the beauty standards, and her life will be vastly improved. And it's not even necessarily something that comes from like a vanity perspective or an insecure kind of perspective. It's something that is done as a kind of practical conscious decision to improve their life societally because it's considered to lead to a better job and a better boyfriend and a better social circle if you kind of tick all these boxes as a woman, which is something that I've never read about before really. And I just found it so, so interesting. And I really, really enjoyed that element of this book. I just found it very compelling. Basically, it goes without saying, like, as women, I think we know all too well, these levels of beauty standards and the pressure to conform to them, they exist all over the world in various different forms, depending on what that culture decides is acceptable. But I have never read a book that addresses it so kind of bluntly and really shines a spotlight on it in the same way. Oh, hi. It would seem that I now have a cat contributing to this conversation. <laughs> so I can only apologize for this, which is just gonna wibble and wobble its way around. And that's kind of only one of the topics that this book covers really. There's a huge spectrum of issues that these women face through their narratives. Um, and at times I kind of wish that it wasn't stretching itself 
quite so thin to cover so many things at once. Like maybe kind of one less narrative or something might have made the others feel a little bit richer and a bit more kind of fully formed. I think that is probably actually just my preference because I was so fascinated by the plastic surgery stuff and I wanted more about the beauty industry because I find that very interesting anyway. This author's writing style, I can't believe this is a debut novel. Honestly, sometimes you just read a debut novel and you're like, what? How? Why? This is amazing. And I thought it was a very clever mix between addressing some pretty dark and gripping topics. At times it's almost brutal and very eye-opening, it's super informative, but then that is also balanced with these female narratives and the friendships that these women have together that are very real and soft. It gives you this kind of feeling of female solidarity, which is really touching. So that's quite a nice contrast between the two things. I think that's super clever. And when I was kind of flipping back through this to make some notes, I remembered that I was quite disappointed by the ending. But the more I've thought about it, the more I actually think it was quite a clever ending to this story. It's nothing that's like neatly tied up at the end with a little pink bow, like it's not that kind of ending. It's left quite kind of open and it's a little bit unsatisfying as a reader. But then when you're telling a realistic story, those characters are the real people that will continue to live those challenging and demanding day-to-day -day lives. They don't just get rounded off neatly at the end. And it's an important reminder as a reader that the issues that are raised in the story are, are very much real issues and they're still ongoing, you know? So if you can't tell, I absolutely loved this one. It was one of my favorite books of 2021 actually, and it should 100% be heading onto your TBR pile. I'm so excited to talk about this one. Hold on to your horses, hold on to your hats, hold on to your hollyhocks and your hobnobs and also your heebie-jeebies. This was my best book of 2021. This is the one. Toot toot. It was actually a very easy win for me as well because this book stayed with me. I, I'm not joking, parts of this book literally haunt me. <laughs> I think about it all the time, still. I read this months ago and I still think about this. Um, I was sad to let the characters go and it gave me really weird dreams at the time. And if that doesn't sell it to you, <laughs> I don't know what will. Um, so this is The Mercies by Kieran Millwood Hargrave. Now, first things first, let me just get this off my chest. Did I buy this for the very beautiful floral sprayed edges. Look, ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. So, The Mercies. This book kicks off on Christmas Eve in 1617. Ah, oh, I remember it well. And we as a reader are taken to the middle of nowhere, to this very remote, about as remote as it gets, a Norwegian island called Vardo. And just as we arrive there, the surrounding sea of Vardo is whipped up into a frenzy by a completely insane storm. And as our main character, Marin, watches out onto the water from her home, all of the men of Vardo who've been sent out fishing at that time are swallowed up by this huge wave in the storm. So all of the men are gone in an instant and only the women of Vardo are left to fend for themselves in this completely hostile, brutal, remote environment. And that's not the only bad news either because just as the women are starting to adjust to life by themselves, a God-fearing Scottish man is sent over by his community to Vardo and he's been sent to take control of Vardo and take control of these women who've been left to themselves, to their own devices, and to bring this kind of godforsaken place back to being a respectable community. And unfortunately for the women, little do they know that he's actually risen to political success back at home um, because he's been burning witches. Yeah, he's he's one of them. He also brings over his new young wife with him to Vardo to relocate with. Her name is Ursa and Ursa meets Marin when she arrives at Vardo. They're kind of thrust together in this very lonely, scary environment and they find that they have an instant connection together. Like any of the books that kind of bring witch trials into the story, it's a really clever look at how like suspicion and gossip can really kind of work their way through a society and poison everybody involved and how something that starts off as something so small can transform into this like widely believed truth which I suppose is still very relevant to like you know modern society and the online world plus very cool detail which I was very interested in the storm that kicks off in Vardo was 
actually a real storm. And of course the whole kind of time of witch trials as well was very much a real thing too. So it makes it even more of like a darker and more haunting kind of read when you remember that people really did live through these completely brutal, like merciless times, especially as a woman. Not only is the plot great, but I felt like the writing in The Mercies was, I'm gonna sound a bit crazy when I say this, It it's like the same feeling as eating a really delicious meal. It genuinely like nourishes you as a reader when you're reading it because it's just so good and I completely devoured it. There was just something about this literally from the first paragraph that I read, I was like, right, I'm in, I know I'm gonna love this. From beginning to end, I just found it so hauntingly beautiful. There's this one particular scene where one of the women is being transported to her witch trial. And for some reason, it's just like burn into my brain. I found it literally haunting. It chilled me to the bone. It's just so full of that really kind of edgy, palpable atmosphere that leaves you feeling a little bit kind of breathless and on edge. And there's all this kind of tension and eeriness and coldness, and it's just so good. I think the real kind of magic of this one is that feeling and like the bleak landscape of Vardo contrasted against this very kind of tender, soft, gentle relationship that starts to spark. I honestly can't tell you enough how much this needs to go onto your TBR pile. It's my absolute book of 2021. Honestly, one of my favorites ever. I'm a sucker for witches, but this really had an impact on me. Number three, this is Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. I feel like loads of you will have read this one. And this was a particularly interesting discovery for me because on paper, this should have been my jam. My strawberry jam in a Victoria sponge. I should have loved it from cover to cover. But I, I, as I always say, I hate saying anything negative about books. I hate it. But what's the point if I'm not gonna be super honest? So I found that the first half of Hamnet, I'd say about the first half, was a slow process quite slow. Felt like a little bit of a slog to me and I was really surprised that I didn't completely fall in love with it. But let me let me give you a brief little overview first. So as you might be able to tell from the title, it is Shakespeare related, Shakespeare adjacent. Um, it's the story behind the title of his very famous play, which of course we all know and love and spent many hours on spark notes trying to understand. <laughs> but old Bill, Will Shakey himself, is actually not hugely involved in this. In fact, he's more of a kind of side character who's, his name is never even mentioned. And it's actually all about the story of his wife, Agnes. So as the blurb says, this is not a spoiler. If you pick this up in Waterstones, you will find this out. One of their twins is taken ill when the plague reaches London. They very sadly won't survive the week. So it becomes a story that is all about grief. I think grief is kind of the overarching theme of the story and how grief affects people and shows itself in people, particularly grief as a mother. So as you can imagine, there is some really moving parts to this story. A lot of it is very beautifully written and very poignant. It really feels like it's been written with a lot of care and heart behind it, which is lovely to read. I did share, shed a couple of tears, I'm not gonna lie, but I think it comes across so strongly that the author has written this with so much care and attentiveness to it and her writing is just beautiful. It feels like you're in very safe hands when you read it and it's such a beautiful writing style to the point that it it sometimes feels like it's you know kind of like lyrical. It feels like lyrics sometimes it's written with such a rhythm and a pattern and a flow to it. It's just gorgeous. It's very very descriptive and vivid. So if you like a lot of style to your writing and you love picking up a book and just being immersed in just how beautiful it is, you'll definitely really, really love this. I'm just picking up my notes because there is, there's literally like one tiny insignificant quote that I just loved so much. There's this one part where she describes kittens with faces like pansies. I just loved that so much. I thought it was just the most cute and perfect little sentence. I just, I think of my little Flo having a face like a pansy. She doesn't, she has a face like a, mischievous elf. So for me it was a great premise and the language was just so beautiful it was a little bit overwhelming at some times. Aside from that though I did have a couple of problems getting through this. I found it a little bit too slow paced even for me and I like a gentle read. I'm a total weirdo and I just have to finish every book but if I wasn't like that and I was one of these people that's like oh life's too short if you're not into it move on. Um, if I felt like that I 
I would have put this down and not continued it because it just, something about it just didn't grab me. But then dot, 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 something, something magical happened. And it's the most unexpected moment that I've, I think I've maybe ever had with a book because, um, right, I'm gonna sound completely insane here, but hear me out. Basically, there's a chapter that describes the plague arriving in England. It's, it's all about the journey of a flea. Am I selling this? <laughs> that might not sound like the most enjoyable chapter that a person can read, but let me tell you, that chapter about a tiny flea is some of the most amazingly crafted hypnotic writing. I was completely captivated by it. The rest of this book, I was literally like, oh, come on. Like, you know when you're kind of willing it to pick up the pace a little bit? This little snippet about the flea, I was in. So that was all it took. All it took was a flea. One small step <laughs> for a reader, one giant leap for a flea. So there were moments like that, like the, like the flea of absolute magic that I could not get enough of. It's brilliantly imagined. I loved the kind of imagining behind it. And I really like the idea as well. I think it's so clever of taking a historical figure like Shakespeare's wife that we don't really know anything about and fictionalizing her and making her become kind of fully formed and a real person to relate to and understand. But I have to be honest and say there were a lot of moments as well that I just didn't fall in love with. And a lot of the time, as I said, I was kind of wishing this book away a little bit, which always makes me feel really guilty. In all honesty, thinking about it now, I can't actually remember a lot of what else happens. Um, I think it'll mostly just make you very glad that you didn't live in the 16th century, <laughs> to be quite honest. It's a TBR if you love beautiful language, if you love kind of a deep dive into emotion, if you love kind of beautiful poetic writing, then you're gonna love it. If you're here for a fast moving plot, give it a miss, but then you will miss the flea. I told you there were some heavy hitters. Whoa, Nelly. There she blows. This is Beautiful World, Where Are You? by Sally Rooney. When I say I was excited to read this book, I think The Mercies was my favorite book of 2021, but this was easily my most anticipated book of 2021. I was counting down the days. Oh, you're back. Like all good respectable millennials, uh, Sally Rooney has me in an intense chokehold that I can do absolutely nothing about. I know she can be a little bit divisive, but I think the people that love her love her. I am of that camp. I think conversations with friends and normal people are, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna say exquisite. And I do think, you know, the majority of kind of all my friends and she's a must read for a lot of our demographic. So I can't even imagine the pressure that must come when you're trying to keep that track record going and you're trying to stay up to that standard for people. <laughs> honestly think I would just just literally constantly cry all of the time. <laughs> just I probably wouldn't even bother to be honest. But anyway, <laughs> Beautiful World, Where Are You? Here it is. It arrived. Completely speech markless and with high expectations. Like the other Sally Rooney books, rather than it being kind of specifically about a particular plot or events that happen, it's more about the sentences that feel like they're punching you in the guts. It's more about the feeling that the prose gives you rather than any particular plot line. It's those moments where you read the book and you're like, God damn. <laughs> but this one, this is about Alice and Eileen. They're best friends since college and they are about to turn 30. So if you are that age, this is the perfect time to read this book. Alice is a very successful writer. She's like, famous and Eileen works at a magazine so her kind of day-to-day -day working life is a lot more of what we would consider to be like normal and the book intertwines their separate love stories that are written in the third person alongside another separate narrative which is formed between these emails that they send to each other they're very very long emails they're very thoughtful and kind of like pensive meandering so it's quite unique in that way it's quite a unique mix of what's considered to be like you know mundane relationship stuff and then very deep and meaningful conversations between these women so it almost feels like 
the author's kind of elevating the relationship stuff to be on the same level of importance as the kind of more typically like intelligent conversation that the girls are choosing to share, which I thought was quite interesting because surely those kind of life experiences that shape us into the people that we are and you know, the happy and the sad moments that we experience, are they not the important stuff compared to the the typical like intelligent conversation topics. I think if you are around this kind of age, if you're like late 20s, early 30s, and you've liked her other books, there's no doubt that you'll enjoy this because it's her kind of signature style. It's that real feeling of like, the uncertainty of life and not really having any faith in your own decisions. You know, just kind of attempting to figure out all the hard stuff that happens at this age. This is the real coming of age time, I'm telling you. People who say it's like 16, 17, 18 are incorrect. The real coming of age is 30. <laughs> One of the kind of funny parts of the Sally Rooney books is that you can be reading it and really, really enjoying it page to page while also simultaneously realizing that actually the characters themselves that you're reading about, <laughs> You, like, you don't like them at all and they're kind of driving you slightly insane with their decisions. I think the real magic is in the kind of gaps in the conversation and the unspoken moments between the characters and the uncertainties and the anxieties in the way that they kind of say the wrong things and make the wrong decisions and it's, it's kind of the polar opposite of what you might expect in a fiction that's describing a relationship because we're so used to relationships that kind of ebb and flow in a perfect way and then you get these these people that are suddenly quite realistic and flawed and they're making terrible decisions they're saying the wrong things and they're avoiding confronting their problems and they're avoiding the awkward conversations to fix things but actually they're the things that we all do every single day if, if we're brave enough to admit that we do that and you can recognize those and identify them in your own life. And that's the kind of real connection that you get with Sally Rooney's writing. I did enjoy it. I think it's great, but it sits third in line to the throne of my favorite Sally Rooney books, um, which is not, you know, that's not a bad thing. It's like saying, oh, this is my third favorite chocolate or this is my third favorite cheese. And last but not least, for today's bunch of books, we're going from something that I anticipated for so long and literally counted down the days to reading and could not wait to get my mitts on to something that I spontaneously picked up. Again, did this cover influence me? It's all like slightly sparkly golden embroidery. And who am I to say no to a dark green cover with sparkly embroidery on it? So this is The Confessions of Franny Langton by Sarah Collins. Um, and to be fair, it wasn't just the cover that grabbed my attention of this one. As soon as I read the blurb, I was like, ooh. That's a bit of me. So it's London, circa 1820, and servant girl Franny Langton is accused of killing her mistress and her master. Franny is adamant that she would never have done anything to hurt her mistress because she completely loved her dearly and they were very close. But the only problem is that Franny can't actually remember anything about that fateful evening which is a bit of a shocker. And the accusations of murder are basically the latest crazy development in the in Franny's wild roller coaster of a life. She starts out as a plantation slave in Jamaica and through the course of the story, she moves from slave to servant to ladies maid to sex worker to opium addict in the end and now she's accused of being a murderer as well. And we meet Franny as she's writing down her whole life story from behind the bars of Newgate Prison. She's trying to piece her whole story together before she faces her final trial. So the book starts, we're transported back to Jamaica to start her story from the beginning. And I think it goes without saying that we are confronted with all the cruelty that that whole time involved. Franny is basically picked out by the head of her house, like the master of the house. She's selected by him to assist with his scientific experiments. And they are never really fully explained by the author. They remain quite ambiguous, but they involve race and are, you know, unquestionably something horrific. They're so bad that they've lost him, the support of his main sponsor, um, who kind of refused to support his work anymore. So you're left as a reader to kind of fill in the gaps and use your imagination. I think less gore is often the way to create something even more horrible. And the implication there is what feels very heavy and dark. And after I'd read this, I read that the author wanted to create something that was quite gothic. And I think she's done that in such a clever way. There's some tropes of gothic novels that are introduced into this, 
but she does it in such a different way but you still get that same kind of like foggy dark like heaviness of a gothic novel you get that real sense of atmosphere that puts you on edge a little bit as you're reading through it but in very unique clever ways like the darkness of a gothic novel really comes through without needing anything that's remotely like cheesy or spooky or you know ghosty or anything like that instead it's this feeling of like very palpable like looming dread that complements the the setting of this book very well in that old oldy grimy london kind of feeling and i just thought it was a really good old concept of like a historical whodunit like who wouldn't want to read that that's so exciting basically everyone else in this novel is horrible and awful to the point where when Franny is kind of accused of being a murderer you're kind of like well they did kind of have it coming but I will warn you that the ending is not happy <laughs> just give me a nice wholesome happy ending for the love of god I do seem to remember losing the thread of what was going on a little bit in maybe kind of like the final quarter of this but as we all know from golden days of GCSEs when a book is written from a narrative of a memoir or a diary. We always have to question our narrator, folks. Not to mention the fact that opium is also quite heavily involved in this story, so you have to bring that into consideration as well. But it did mean that I was a bit confused and had kind of lost the thread of what was happening. <laughs> but it did pick up again at the end. I really enjoyed it. I think I gave it like three and a half out of five. Um, so that's a pretty decent read. I wouldn't say it's gonna make like my top 10 stack anytime soon. Worth a read if you like a bit of historical fiction. I love the mixture between historical fiction and whodunit. The race element and how that affects everything was also really interesting. I liked the gothic vibes that were going on and I definitely think it's worth a read. So if that sounds like something up your street, you should give it a go. So that is me done for the day. I think I've spoken so much that I've made myself slightly hoarse. So uh, that means I've officially rambled way too much. But I hope you enjoyed this one. Nice to hang out with you, nice to see you. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these, what you thought about them, if you're gonna pick any of them up for yourself, and if you've got any recommendations for me, they are always very welcome. I'm gonna leave all the other places you can find me, Instagram, Storygraph, Goodreads, they'll all be in the description box down below, and I will see you very soon with another video.